If we're simple and easy, our lives become simple and easy. Can you be simple and easy in your practice? Just with what is. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. There's a description in one of the texts of the Buddha sitting on the top of a mountain called Vulture Peak, which is outside the village of Rajgir in India. And he was surrounded by an assembly of monks and nuns and lay people giving a discourse. Buddha was sitting there Everything was very silent and still. And he held up a flower. One of the great disciples, Mahakasapa, smiled. That's the text. The Buddha holds up a flower, and Mahakasapa smiles. In the holding up of that flower, the whole of the Dhamma is revealed. If we know how to understand that correctly, to see that flower correctly, we can understand how forms conditioned by different causes are constantly changing whether it's the form of a flower, the form of a thought, form of the body. Forms conditioned by causes, continually changing. We see that in the flower. Looking at that flower, we can understand the nature of beauty. We can also understand the nature of decay. Beauty and decay in the flower. We can understand the nature of attachment, and the tendency of the mind to become attached to form, to become attached to beauty. We see the nature of attachment. We can understand the suffering that comes from that attachment as the form, as the beauty changes. When we look at that flower, we can understand in the deepest way the meaning of emptiness. Emptiness of essential self. What is the flower except a collection of different elements arranged in a particular way? There's actually no one thing which we could call flower, aside from the relationship of the different parts. So we understand the meaning of emptiness, emptiness of self. And looking at that flower, (coughs) we can also understand what in some Buddhist traditions are called the suchness of things. That is, the sense of things just as they are. When you see a color, there's a certain suchness to the experience. How can we describe a color? You hear the sound of the bell. It's 
the suchness of the moment, the suchness of the experience. When we're just in that moment, there's no bell, there's no ear, there's no inside, there's no outside, there's no self, there's just just what there is. The profundity of that discourse of the Buddha is that it reveals or shows to us that in every moment of experience, <clears throat> the Buddha is holding up the flower. In every thought, in every sensation, in every sound, in every feeling, in every sight, in every moment of experience, it's as if the Buddha is giving this discourse. We can understand all of these things. The whole of the Dharma is there, moment after moment. When we can appreciate this, we see that the whole of the Dharma is contained in the flower, is contained in a moment. Then we understand why Maha Kasapa smiled. The art of meditation is learning how to settle back into the moment. So that instead of reaching out for something, we learn how to settle back into each moment's experience just as it arises, just as it presents itself. It's really the art of active listening. We sit in a room and are listening to music, and it's music we love a lot <clears throat> and are paying <clears throat> careful attention. <clears throat> Generally, <clears throat> as you're listening to the music, you're not going like this toward the speakers. It's like we listen and we're receptive. <clears throat> we allow the music, we allow the sound to come to us. But so often in our practice, it's as if we're doing this. We're toppling forward into the next moment. And so what we need to do is to learn this fine art of settling back, of listening to experience, but very actively. We can get a sense of this <clears throat> very clearly in the walking meditation in seeing the difference between a certain mode of perception <clears throat> in which we're watching as opposed to feeling. When we're watching things <clears throat> and a lot of our language in the talks reinforces that. Watch it, observe it, notice it. And so we get the sense often <clears throat> that we're on the outside of experience looking at it. As another possibility, see if you can play in the domain of feeling experience. As you're walking, as you're stepping, can you feel the leg? rather than watching it. You see, as you drop into that feeling mode, immediately there's a sense of oneness with the experience. We're not on the outside watching it, but we actually have become the experience. With the breath, can we feel it rather than be watching it? There was one person in the Buddhist time who was very intent on awakening, very anxious to become enlightened. And he had been to very many teachers, but had not found, had not found what he was looking for. He learned about the Buddha 
who was quite some distance away. And this man <clears throat> walked all across India to find the Buddha to get the teachings. And after this long journey, he met up with the Buddha as he was going for his uh, alms round, collecting food. He met the Buddha in the village and he said, Sir, please teach me. Please give me the teachings. And the Buddha said, Wait, let me finish this alms round of food. We'll go back to the monastery. Be glad to teach you. This man was very insistent. He said, No, please teach me now. And the Buddha said, please wait, and we'll go back, and at the proper time, be glad to give you the teachings. The man was very insistent. You know, he was so anxious. And he said, you may die, I may die, please teach me now. So the Buddha was very impressed with his earnestness. But what to do? They were standing in the middle of the road. The Buddha had his bowl full of food. And so the teachings had to be very succinct. <laughs> and so he gave this particular teaching. Just to jump ahead of the story a little bit, the man heard this teaching and became enlightened. So listen carefully. <laughs> because it really says it all. What the Buddha told this man, what he taught him about the Dhamma, he said, in the seen that is seen with the eyes, there is just what is seen. And in the heard, there is just what is heard. And in the sensed, that is smell and taste and sensed in the body, there is just what is sensed, and in the thought, just what is thought. In the seen, just the seen. In the heard, just the heard. In the sensed, just the sensed. In the thought, just the thought. There is just what there is in each moment. The man heard this, this great opening. As the story goes on, just afterwards, a wild cow came up, and gored him, and he died. But he had made it. <laughs> just in time. <laughs> it's so simple. But our minds are so complicated. Can we settle back into each moment's experience in the breath, just the breath, in a sound, just the sound, in a sensation, just the sensation? The problem is we're never satisfied. We kind of jump in, oh, I want it this way, or I want it that way, or if it could be something else. And so the art of our practice is to learn the simplicity, to learn the settling back into the moment. When we do this, even for a little bit, we find that the meditation, like everything else, has its own rhythm. You know, when we're engaged in sports, or engaged in music, or dance, or anything, we see that each activity has a rhythm appropriate to it, and that the ease and grace of performing that action comes about when we find the rhythm. Our inner experience also has a rhythm. We can settle back and allow, in its own time, each breath, each sound, each sensation to arise and to pass away if we can be with it in a non-interfering awareness. If we can simply let things be. This rhythm of experience establishes itself. And we find that place of grace, of ease. The 
There's an old Chinese saying. Sitting quietly, doing nothing, spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Sitting quietly, doing nothing, spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Can we sit quietly in this way? Sitting quietly, doing nothing. How nice. Breath comes, thoughts come, sounds come, sensations come. It's all doing itself. We simply have to get out of the way, allowing for the rhythm of it. In doing this, we open to what the ancient Taoists called the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. When we're not interfering, we open ourselves to the whole range of experience, some of which is very painful, there's a lot of suffering, some of which is very joyous, there's a lot of light. Sitting quietly, doing nothing, the whole world reveals itself. Sometimes people hear this, and it sounds very passive. But in a true understanding of it, you see that it's not a passivity that's involved, but actually an active connection with each moment's experience. It's the difference between what the Taoists call non-action and inaction. Inaction is a withdrawal. Inaction is doing nothing. Inaction is passivity. Non-action is that stillness of mind, that balance of mind, that openness of mind, which allows for the 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. Everything is coming and going, and we are each one of those. Without a reaching out, without a holding on, without a pushing away. It's the difference between equanimity of mind and indifference of mind. Two very different qualities. Indifference is a pulling back. Indifference is a not caring. Indifference is a non-connection. Equanimity is that perfect balance of mind which accepts everything. <sighs> it's the difference between a response and a reaction. So often our minds are just immediately reactive. Things are coming up and we like it and we hold on and we don't like it and we push away. A responsiveness can come out of non-action of mind, out of that stillness. The story of a friend of mine who was studying in India, and she had been visiting in Calcutta and coming back to Bodh Gaya, which is the place of the Buddha's enlightenment. And she was in a rickshaw in Calcutta going to the train station. It was late at night. And they were going down some dark street and all of a sudden, somebody from the side of the street started to pull her out of the rickshaw. And she was very frightened. It was, this was an intense moment. Fortunately, the friend she was with managed to kind of push this person away. And they got to the train station, get back to Bodhgaya. And she's telling our teacher, Munindraji, the story of what happened. And he's listening very carefully and very interested to know all the details of it. She comes to the end of the story and he says, Oh dear, with all the loving kindness in your heart, you should have taken your umbrella and hit that man over the head. <laughs> Non-action is not inaction. Sometimes strong response is necessary. Sometimes strong action is necessary with all the loving kindness in our heart we often forget about that side of it. Most of you are familiar probably with <clears throat> the poet Gary Snyder. 
he studied for many years in Japan. One of his teachers named Oda, Ses Oda Seso Roshi said something very nice about the simplicity of practice. He said, in the Dharma, there are only two things. You sit and you sweep the garden. It doesn't matter how big the garden is. We sit and we sweep the garden. And we each have different gardens. And some of them are small gardens and some of them are very large gardens. We sit, we cultivate this quality of listening, of settling back into the moment, and then we manifest. Manifesting this very quality. The power of the Buddhist teachings is the power of simplicity. You know, and you can see that that's what we are practicing here. What could be simpler? Lifting, moving, placing. It's hard to get a simpler movement than that. And it always sits still, in and out, rise and fall. Dropping back, settling back into the simplicity of each moment. And what we begin to do as the meditation <clears throat> deepens, as our capacity for being simple grows, we begin to expand the sense of settling back into the moment, not only in the sitting, not only in the walking meditation. Can it be done in even the small movements that we make during the day? The slight shifts of position. We move our arm, we stand up, we turn. Can we refine our sense of presence so that we settle back even to these very subtle movements? So that our whole day unfolds in this rhythm of changing phenomena. As we quiet down, as we slow down, the refinement of our perception can become so powerful. One teacher expressed the meditation practice in this very simple way. He said, if you sit and know you're sitting, the whole of the Dharma is revealed. For those of you who don't like techniques, Sit and know you're sitting. Breathe, know you're breathing. Walk, know you're walking. Eat, know you're eating. The simplicity of the practice is dropping back into the moment. This simplicity this very great and deep simplicity leads to a quality in the mind of great spaciousness. Instead of the mind being cramped and tight and reactive, in this simplicity of being present in the moment, as if the mind begins to expand, create space inside, <clears throat> The Taoist phrase which expresses this very nicely is called free and easy wandering. It always resonated with him. It's just that quality of freedom and of ease and of openness. This free and easy wandering does not mean simply getting lost in things. It doesn't mean getting carried away, getting caught up. What it means is that there is <clears throat> an all-embracing acceptance of what is arising. Whatever it is that comes up, we're willing to be with. And we can see that 
the sense of struggle that we have in our practice and in our lives comes about when we're not willing to accept something that's present. Maybe there are uncomfortable sensations. We're not accepting them, so we get into a struggle. Maybe there are uncomfortable emotions. And we're see feeling certain emotions of sadness or anger or loneliness or unworthiness. And if we can't open to them, if we can't accept them, so then we're in this conflict. Like everything else, the feelings come, they're there, they go, they wash through. When we're accepting, they're not a problem. And so it's just learning how to look, how to see what's there. This ability to be accepting is personified beautifully in the poetry of Ryokan, who was a Zen hermit monk of the 18th century. And he actually did live in a little hut in the woods up in the mountains. And he wrote this wonderful poetry, different kinds of haiku poetry, just about his experience. It's very simple, very open. At one time, he just had these very few things <clears throat> You know, in his little cabin. And he came back and he found that everything had been stolen. <clears throat> and he sat down and he wrote, he wrote a little poem. The moon at the window, the thief left it behind. <clears throat> How would we be if we came home and found everything was stolen? That openness, just that that ability to be with what, what is present also opens up a very deep possibility of compassion because we're open to the suffering in ourselves, to the feelings of suffering. We're open to the feelings of suffering in others. One of his other poems, which so expresses this feeling of compassion, Oh, that my monk's robes were wide enough to gather up all of the suffering people in this floating world. So simple and so embracing. Oh, that my monk's robes were wide enough to gather up all of the suffering people in this floating world. It comes from the simplicity of allowing whatever is present to be there. As we do this, we learn so many things about this process of life. We begin to see for ourselves <clears throat> the momentary changing nature of phenomena. We're sitting quietly doing nothing watching everything come and go, our thoughts, our feelings, the sensations in the body, sounds, situations in our life, people. It's all this flow of constant change. We go from a theoretical understanding of that to a direct personal experience of how it's happening moment to moment. We open to the suffering that exists. We're not closing ourselves off from it. We begin to get an understanding, even just a glimpse, of the selflessness of this whole process. But there's no one behind it to whom it's happening, but rather what we are is the changing process. In the seen, just the seen. In the heard, just the heard. In the sensed, just the sensed. What we are is this process of momentary experience arising and passing. There are times in the practice when we get a sense of the selflessness. There's an 
a feeling and an observing of the process, and it can sometimes feel as if it's happening to someone else. There is so little identification with what is going on. Great care is needed to understand that mindfulness is not paranoia. <clears throat> it's not going through life or through the retreat or through an hour, you know, contracted and tight and waiting to pounce on each moment. <laughs> That's not mindfulness. That's paranoia. <laughs> That's being grim. It's not grimness. It is this very light and easy and spacious settling back, the sense of free and easy wandering. Can we settle back and allow things to come and go, come and go? It's all doing itself. Can we settle into the rhythm of it? A key element of this is the quality in the mind <clears throat> of interest. Are we interested in what is happening? What is a thought? What is it? It's an amazing phenomenon. Thoughts brought you here. Thoughts create houses. Thoughts get us married. Oh, it'd be nice to go have a pizza. Into the car, downtown, into the store. Our whole life. It's like we're slaves of these thoughts. What are they? When we just sit and take some interest in it as a phenomenon, it's fantastic. These thoughts which so dominate our lives of every kind, some are wonderful and noble thoughts, some are debased thoughts, the whole show. But we sit and look not at the content, but actually taking interest in it as a phenomenon. It's, it's amazing. This thought is this momentary, ephemeral, transparent bubble that has no weight at all. It just arises and vanishes. And yet it's this very same phenomenon when we're not paying attention, when we're not being mindful, when we're not interested in it, totally runs our lives. I don't know whether you find that as interesting as I do. <laughs> it amazes me. <laughs> And so we want to bring this quality just of interest to what this is, what our life is made of. You know, what is an emotion? We get so caught up in the content of our stories. And there's happiness, or there's excitement, or there's fear, or there's anger, or there's rage, or there's this and that. Can we take interest in the phenomenon of that experience, of that situation? What is anger? Now just what is the energy like? What is it? It's like this amazing, powerful storm. Okay, can we feel it? Can we open to it? Not getting caught up, not getting identified, but really from a place of exploration. What is sadness? What is happiness? What actually is that feeling? What is the energy? This is the quality which, if we bring into our practice, gives us the sense of a tremendous discovery. And it's not esoteric, it's not some mystical knowledge. It's happening in each moment. Every single moment, the Buddha is holding up the flower. Oh, hum, another flower. <laughs> I mean, so often, that's how we're relating. And so in our practice, we're cultivating and attention, we're cultivating interest 
just into the mystery of it all, into the power of it all. So the Buddha holds up the flower and Maha Kasapa smiles. The question that arises for us is why we're not smiling. Why don't we smile like Maha Kasapa? <laughs> what keeps us from smiling? What keeps us from this very simple settling back into the moment with interest, with that sense of discovery? One of the things that keeps us from it, that is an obstacle, are all the kinds of expectations that we bring to the moment. Expectation and resistance. If we have some idea of how we would like things to be, we're missing what is actually there. It's like a barrier or a veil over what is presenting itself very simply. Are you familiar with the sense of sitting, being with the breath, and making a fairly good effort to be attentive, but still in the background, the sense of waiting for something to happen. It's happened. <laughs> and if you're waiting for something to happen, you've missed it. But it's such a pervasive conditioning. It's just even in this very subtle level. So we're with the in-breath, waiting for the outbreath, or the rising for the next one. And so just to begin to be aware of this, this overlay of expectation, sometimes it takes ridiculous proportions. There was a time in my practice, I'd been, <clears throat> I'd been meditating for quite a few years. I was in Bodh Gaya in India. I got into the place in my practice where it was really going beautifully. Every time I sat, it's like the body dissolved into light. And it was blissful, it was wonderful. And this lasted for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I thought, this is great. <laughs> Came back to the States you know, for a few months, did some work and visited. And I couldn't wait to get back to India. And I went back in a few months to get back to my body of light. Got back, started practicing again. This body of light had become a body of twisted steel. <laughs> yeah, and I'd be sitting and it would be all knotted up and tight and tense. And for the next two years, I was practicing trying to get that experience back. It was the most frustrating time. I was just fighting. I was pushing the mind to, okay, open up, open up. <laughs> it was ridiculous. It took two years of that tremendous suffering and struggle in practice to finally catch on that I was missing the point. It took me that time to learn just to settle back and open to the body of twisted steel. That's what was happening. I didn't have to struggle, didn't have to make it something else. And as soon as I finally got that, the things started moving and unfolding in a different way, a completely different way. But there was no struggle anymore. I've had you this story in the hopes that you don't spend two years in that mode. <laughs> That's one of the obstacles for us. Holding on to some experience that we've had in the past is like dragging a corpse around. The experience is gone, it's over, it's finished. Kaput. Can we let go? 
and continue the process of unfolding. We don't know where it's leading. Sometimes it's bodies of light, sometimes it's twisted steel, sometimes it's whatever. There's another obstacle that keeps us from smiling. It's not only this overlay of expectation, it's also this tendency that we have to place the responsibility for our mind states and our feelings and our emotions on people or situations outside of ourselves. We don't take responsibility in a fundamental way for our own sense of well-being. I was in a relationship quite a few years ago. I feel somebody I'm still very friendly with. And there was one great line that came out of the relationship. My partner say to me often, stop making me feel aversion. <laughs> we all do that, you know, or we all do that at some time anyway. In where instead of seeing how we are getting caught, how we are getting identified with a particular emotion, it's not to, it's not to deny that there are causes and conditions in the external world. There certainly are. But the problem does not lie in the situation outside of ourselves. The suffering or freedom lies in our relationship to that emotion, to that experience. Are we caught? Are we identified? Are we open to it and letting it arise and pass, wash through us? It's a very and touching story of this situation. A couple of years ago, we had a Tibetan Lama visit us at the center in Massachusetts. He was a master of the Tumo meditation, which is uh, raising the body temperature. He had been living in a cave for years in Dharamsala, behind where the Dalai Lama as his, as his headquarters. Harvard University was doing an experiment, you know, on testing this phenomenon, exploring this phenomenon. And they requested the Dalai Lama to please send somebody, you know, that they could hook up. And so the Dalai Lama requested this Lama to come. He flew, he went right from his cave in Dharamsala to <laughs> Delhi, to Boston, to the hospital, to the medical hospital, where you know, they hooked him up to all these equipment, all this equipment. And after about, you know, a week of these kind of tests and everything, uh, a mutual friend brought him out to the center. That's all he had seen of America. And so the hospital, <laughs> the hospital and the meditation center. <laughs> and we were talking with him through the translator. And he was quite an interesting person because unlike many of the... Tibetan and other Asian uh, monks, he had come to be a monk quite late in life. He had actually been a Tibetan guerrilla fighter. And we asked him, now how was it that without all of these years of you know, preliminary practice and you know, all the years of laying the foundation, you've become so adept, so proficient at this quite advanced kind of meditation. He told us a little bit of his background. He said for years he had been a guerrilla fighter and engaged in a tremendous amount of violent activity. You know, a lot of killing and just not very good things. Then he was captured by the Chinese. And while he was captured, uh, they began to torture him. And he said just when he was captured, he made a kind of inner resolve or inner commitment that whatever they did 
to his body. He was not going to allow hatred to fill his mind. And that, that was his commitment, that was his practice. Now imagine, this is a really intense, extreme situation. And he said, for all the time of his captivity, going through that tremendous suffering, he was so protecting of his mind that he would not let hatred enter into it. Finally, he was released and he went to India and started practicing. And he attributed his, the depth and rapidity you know, of his meditation practice to the fact of that practice while he was in prison. He so guarded his mind. And it was a beautiful example of the understanding that no one can make us feel hatred. No one can make us feel aversion. No one makes us feel anything. In different conditions, certain things arise if we are committed to protecting our minds, protecting this precious, precious jewel. We don't have to get caught. We don't have to get identified. Even when they arise, what is our relationship to them? Are we getting swept away by them? Or are we practicing an awareness and a mindfulness which gives us a sense of balance, gives us a sense of openness. It allows it to come through. This is very different than a quality of repression or of denial or pretending that it's not there. That's not it at all. It's being sensitive enough and interested enough in our own process so that when these feelings, these emotions of whatever kind arise, we're right there with it. We see it. We understand it. We don't get caught. We don't get identified. Tremendous power in that. One obstacle to the settling back into the moment, to the spaciousness of that, is expectation. Another one is when we don't take responsibility for our own mind states and feelings. When we're placing the blame on them outside of ourselves. The third obstacle to being very simple in our practice, in our lives, are all the kinds of images and roles that we take, spiritual self-images. When I first began my practice, I was in the Peace Corps in Thailand. This was in 1965. And nobody I knew was into meditation. It was like this you know, very esoteric activity. And I, I had been going to one of the monasteries there for instruction, and I would go and I would ask so many questions. You know, I was just, I had studied philosophy at college, and I was just badgering these poor monks with questions. And I think they told me to meditate just to, just to get me quiet. You know. <laughs> And so I get all the paraphernalia and, you know, things to sit and, and I, I just, my first sitting was five minutes. So I didn't want to sit too much. <laughs> but I was so, I was so into it and I was so excited by it. Because even in that first few minutes of practice, what was, what was startling to me was the understanding that there was actually a way to look inside. And my whole life had been looking outside, and it was just that turning around of the, of the attention. But there was a way to explore. I got so excited. I used to sit, and then I would invite my friends over to watch me meditate. I'm still doing it. Sometimes the images we have or don't have about our practice. In the beginning, there was, I had so much pain. I could not sit cross-legged at all. It was just too, too unbearable. And so I sat in a chair, but I'm quite tall. And so an ordinary chair is not that comfortable either. So I, I got this chair, it was kind of quite a big armchair <laughs> that I put on bricks. 
and I hung my mosquito net off the chair. So I was like climbing up into this throne. <laughs> and keep... When my teacher would come and visit, I, I really was kind of embarrassed. One of the very great benefits of studying with different teachers is learning that there is no one way to be. You know, because it's so easy to create an image or a model of what a meditator looks like or what a spiritual person is or acts. And when you study with different people and different teachers, you see that they're all quite different. One of my teachers was Munindra, who was this little man dressed in white, very active, busy, running around the bazaar, driving the shopkeepers crazy, bargaining. He had a vast wealth of understanding. I think the teaching he gave me, which was most profound, which is also the thrust of tonight's talk, over and over again, he said, be simple and easy. Be simple and easy. If we're simple and easy, our lives become simple and easy. Can you be simple and easy in your practice? Just with what is. Goenkaji was another teacher, very different. He's family man, businessman, very active, very engaged, very charismatic, a lot of power. And he would have these huge courses, meditation courses. And there was so much power and so much metta in his teaching. And at the same time, he was very involved in the world and very actively involved. Another of the people I studied with was this woman in Calcutta, Deepama, extraordinary being went through a lot of suffering in her life. She was married very young, as in Indian fashion. At that time, she was about 14 when she was married. She had three children quite early on. Two of her children died, her husband died. She became sick, she was in bed for five years. When she started practicing, she was so weak that she had to crawl on her hands and knees up the five or six steps to the meditation hall in Burma. Tremendous, tremendous suffering and tremendous courage in that. Extraordinary mind. She very quickly reached deep levels of enlightenment, did the samadhi concentration practices, developed all these kinds of powers of mind. When you're with her, there is a feeling of the utmost simplicity. She's like everybody's favorite grandma. She just feeds you. She's empty of any kind of sense of self. And in that emptiness, out of that emptiness, comes so much love. And she's also very strong, as you can imagine, somebody who has that level of attainment. On this recent trip to India, we visited her. We were sitting around she was asking each of us about our practice. And she turned to me and she said, I think you should do a two-day sitting. She didn't mean a two-day retreat. She meant one sitting. <laughs> but two days. Because she herself had done, sat three, four, five days at a time. I mean, give you a sense of the power of her mind. And then she looked at me and she said, don't be lazy. And it just gave me a whole new sense of what might be possible. <laughs> because she was certainly taking it quite seriously. So it's, she's some very different than Meninger, very different than Noenka. My most recent teacher that I've been studying with is Upandita, who you may have heard about or studied with, very different again extremely demanding, kind of a fierce Zen type teacher. And it really forces a kind of impeccability in looking that for me at that time in my practice was very, very helpful. Couldn't be practicing on cruise control anymore. Working with Upandita, he 
gives you the message very clearly that it's fine to die in practice. But that really is a noble way to die. <laughs> you know, and it's not a problem. We don't have to become like anybody else. Simply settling back into the moment and letting our own being unfold. Just in closing, I'd like to read something from Ajahn Chah, who was one of Jack's teachers and one of the great forest monks of Thailand. said, I wish that you continue your journeys and practice with much wisdom. Use the wisdom that you have already developed to persevere in practice. This can become the ground for your growth, for the deepening of yet greater understanding and love. Understand that you can deepen your practice in many ways. Don't be lazy. If you find yourself lazy, then work to strengthen those qualities which overcome it. Don't be fearful or timid. If you are timid in practice, then work with your mind so that you can overcome that. With the proper effort and with time, understanding will unfold by itself. In all cases, use your own natural wisdom. You come to where you have no more questions, to that place of silence, to the place in which there is oneness with the Buddha, with the Dhamma, with the universe. And only you can do that. So do it already. From now on, it's up to you.